Sing for joy, O heavens, and exalt, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord is a people, and the Lord of compassion for all those who suffer. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Lake Fenton United Methodist Church. Good morning to all of our friends joining us online through Facebook and YouTube. God is with you this morning just as surely as God is here with all of us in this space. My friends, we are beginning a new sermon series this morning called The Greatest Commandments. Throughout the gospel, Jesus is asked by folks that he meets who and what the greatest commandments are, what, what the greatest commandments are that, that we should follow. And, and Jesus gave a fairly similar answer every single time he was asked this question throughout the Bible. And, and for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about the answer that, that Jesus gave to that question, what Jesus said the greatest commandments were, and, and what that means for all of us who are now looking at those 2,000 years later and thinking about what those commandments mean for us today here in our lives. We will begin that journey this morning. Before we begin, worship service, however, I invite you all to pause for a moment. It's been a long week. They're all long weeks, and, and we're all tired. Take, take a deep breath. Close your eyes. Breathe in the living presence of God here in this space. Breathe out whatever worries or cares have been heavy on your heart this week. Breathe in the healing comfort and grace of God's Holy Spirit and breathe out the fears, the doubts, and the troubles weighing upon your soul. My friends, for the next hour as we share together in this time of worship, I invite you to continue to breathe deeply of God's presence. Continue to be present with God and with all of us here in this place. Leave everything else out there. It will be waiting for you when we're done. It's not going anywhere. Simply be present here with us. Continue to breathe deeply as often as you need to, as long as you need to, here in this space. And, and when you are ready, I invite you to stand as we begin our worship service this morning in song.
we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which can be found in your few bulletins this morning. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In just a moment, I'd like to invite Linda LeSage and Al Halbison to come up and, and help us collect our tithes and offerings for this morning. But, but before we do, I'd, I'd just like to share a quick update, a bit of news for, for all of you. So as many of you know, our, our own Karen Whitaker makes, makes frequent use of our space here when, when we are not using it on the weeknights and weekends when this space would otherwise sit empty. Karen uses this space to do things like give dance lessons and, and lead choir ensembles and do musicals and all the 50,000 other things that we know that Karen Whitaker gets up to in, in her day-to-day -day life. She kills her time very differently than, than us normal people do. <laughs> <laughs> For the past several weeks, Karen has invited a group of young people from Fenton High School, the Fenton Ambassadors, to come up here and do a little bit of out-of-school rehearsing. They are a jazz performance choir of high school students at Fenton High School, including several, including a young man named Ibrahim, um, several of which, including Ibrahim, have have performed right here in our own church. They sang for us online when we were doing our worship services online, and they have performed for us in our Christmas services. And for the past few weeks, they've been rehearsing. And, and last weekend, that group, after doing all of their rehearsing here in this place, went off to Chicago to compete at the national level. And they took, what was the, what was the rank again, Karen? What, what did they do? My friends, growing up, I was a singer, and I spent a lot of time singing in churches, even in times when I didn't want to have anything to do with coming to church, and I didn't want to wake up in the morning. I would still come to church because I knew that the church folks would clap, and they would be appreciative, and they would pour all kinds of compliments and love on me anytime I came and sang. My friends, thank you for being that kind of space. As I have grown up, as I have grown older, those memories have been a tether that has bonded me to the church and the experience of worship and the experience of God's love. My friends, thank you for being the kind of space that still creates those kinds of opportunities for young people in our community, even if they're young people that we don't ever see sitting in the pews next to us on Sunday morning. Thank you for being the kind of church that opens your doors and creates these kinds of opportunities for the young people of our community. My friends, thank you for all of the ways that you give to supporting ministry right here at Lake Fenton United Methodist Church.
Almighty God, it brings us great joy to place these gifts at your altar. May they be for us a source of your abundance as we seek to be builders of your kingdom right here in our own community. Amen. Amen. Keep standing. Keep standing. Don't sit down. <laughs> the peace of God be with you always. And also with you. My friends, please greet one another this morning for the sign of God's peace. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
And now, my friends, as we prepare once again to gather together in a time of prayer, I'd like to ask if there are any joys or concerns that anyone would like to share with us, anything in particular for which we as a congregation can, can be in prayer this morning. Huey's birthday. I do know this. Today is Huey's birthday. Yay. Huey turns 36 today. Doesn't he look great? Doesn't he look great? Way to go, Huey. 36 trombone. I'm going for 110 cornets. There you go. You got it. That's good. I have a praise. Uh, may I results came back with nothing serious. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, praise that we got Cindy moved to her new home, and she seems to be adapting well to it. Excellent. Prayers of Thanksgiving that, that we've gotten Cindy moved into a new living situation, and, and that it's, it's working out really well. Prayers for Dale, Spill, and Mary Lynn. Yep, prayers for Dale and Marilyn Spillers. I just spoke with Dale this morning. Marilyn was in the hospital and had to undergo surgery for a bowel obstruction. And so she is in recovery now and doing well. But they, they asked for continued prayers as, as, she, as she continues to, to walk the long road to, to recovery after surgery. And I have a praise for my friend Bill who finished his radiation treatments last week. We've got a couple months off to recover. Excellent. Prayers of thanks for Bill, who was getting a reprieve from radiation therapy. I have a praise because I'm so joyful to have my cousin with me today. <laughs> Prayers of praise and thanks for my mom's cousin, Marcy, which, which makes you, Marcy, what kind of relation does that Your make you? Cousin first cousin once removed, my first cousin once removed. <laughs> is here. <laughs> prayers, prayers of thanks. She's seen me when I was less than reputable. <laughs> Not very much. And she, and she still showed up to watch me pray. <laughs> I feel like I have to keep bringing more and more family members here to show them. Like, no, no, it's real. I'm a pastor. They won't let me do this. <laughs> They've not kicked me out yet. <laughs> My friends, whatever joys or concerns that you have on your heart this morning, whether they're joys and concerns that you've shared with us, or, or joys or concerns that you've kept to yourself, in just a moment we will share a quiet time together, a moment of silence, in which time I invite you to offer whatever prayers you choose and whatever words you choose in your own hearts as we prepare to come together as a congregation in a time of prayer. Most merciful God, Lord, this morning we come before you with joyful hearts, with thankful hearts. We give you thanks this morning for Huey and the birthday that he is celebrating. We give you thanks for all those small moments of reprieve that you have blessed us to share in this world. Whether it is receiving good news from test results or 
even just getting a break from grueling treatments. For all the ways, both large and small, that you remain with us, strengthen us, and endure with us through all the joys and through all the sorrows of our lives. Lord, this morning we remember also Dale and Marilyn, who though Marilyn is recovering, are still weary in their hearts. We ask that you give Marilyn the strength to endure this recovery, that your healing be upon her, even as we ask that you be with Dale. Ease and soothe his troubled heart as, as he is there for his daughter. As Dale is her strength, we ask that you be Dale's strength. Lord, we pray also for the young people in our lives. You have called us to be caretakers through your Son, Jesus Christ. You told us to look to the children, to be like the children. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for the young people who call this place home even if they don't join us here on Sunday morning. Those young people who have found a second home in this place where they are allowed to give witness through their song, to share their love and their joy with the world. Lord, this morning we ask that you give us hearts to learn from those young people. Give us the joy and the strength to share our own voices, our own songs in this world. Lord, for all these things, those joys and concerns which we have named here before you and those which we have not had the strength to name, but which you, who see all and know all, have seen within our hearts. Lord, we pray to you this morning in the words that your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now at this time I'd like to invite Diane Edmonds to come up and share our scripture reading this morning from the Gospel of Mark. For those of you following along in your pew Bibles or at home, our reading for this morning can be found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. Again, that reading is Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that one. He is one, and besides him there is no other. 
and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'll tell you two stories this morning. One day, when I was 19, my mother asked me to pick my youngest brother, Sean, up from school. I loved my brother, Sean. I mean, I still love my brother, Sean, but he was smaller and cuter then. <laughs> and I looked out for my brother, Sean. I kept him safe from my other brothers, Danny and Michael, who were jerks. <laughs> my brother, Sean, and I were close, so I told my mom, yes, of course, I would pick my brother, Sean, up from school. And then I started playing video games. Well, before long, the time arrived when I had to go get my brother, Sean, and I said, let me finish just one thing. So I finished that one thing, and then I finished the next thing, and the next, and the next. Until before long, my mom called me, absolutely livid, that it was 20 minutes past time for my brother Sean to be picked up from school, and here she was getting a call from them that no one was there to get him. I was a teenager, and I was a stupid teenager at that. I wasn't scared of many things, but I was scared of my mom. <laughs> In my fear, I said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, mom. I'm leaving right now to get him. And my mom said, no, you're not. Clearly, I can't trust you when you tell me that. So now I'm going to get him. She said, go back to playing your video games, but I hope you remember this. Your brother Sean loves you and admires you, and he deserves better from you. As was often the case, my mother was right. I had been selfish, and my brother deserved better. See, I did remember, Mom. <laughs> Second story. About 15 years or so later, I was at home with my own kids. Carmen was at work, and I was getting James ready for preschool. At the time, my oldest, who uses they, them pronouns, and, and whom many of you know as Emily, but who has recently chosen to go by the name Moon, at the time, Moon was going through a really difficult patch in their life. A close family member of ours had recently attempted suicide, and all of us, but especially Moon, <laughs> were really still struggling to process a lot of frightened and painful emotions about it. Moon's schoolwork was beginning to suffer, and most days it was a struggle just to get them to go to school let alone to make it through the entire day without having to be picked up. It was a tough time for all of us. So, so a few months earlier, Carmen and I decided that Moon needed more personal care and attention than they were getting. 
with the two of us both working, and we decided that public school had just gotten to be too difficult and painful an experience for them. They felt uncomfortable around all those groups of kids. So after a whole lot of long and really difficult conversations between my wife and I, I left my job at Habitat for Humanity to be a stay-at-home parent and to homeschool our oldest child, Moon. So for the next few months, our home and our kids were my entire life. Nearly all of my time was spent on housework, cooking, teaching, lesson planning. I spent my days teaching Moon grammar, history, and arithmetic. I spent my evenings cooking dinner and doing laundry. And I spent my nights researching curricula, grading assignments, and creating lesson plans. All day. Every day. For months. And things went really, really well. Until they didn't. And so one day, I was getting James ready for preschool, and at this point, I was tired. I was burned out, and, and by now my anxiety had just steamrolled all over my inner state of mind. As I've shared in the past, I've come to refer to these moments as the storm, and the storm had just rolled in. Things just weren't going as smoothly as they had been in the past. Everything seemed harder. Everything was a fight. And none of it seemed to be working as well. That morning, James was doing what little boys do when they're getting ready in the morning. Namely, anything other than getting ready in the morning. <coughs> and suddenly, everything hit me just crashed into me like a wave. And I just sat down on the ottoman in the middle of our family room, and I remember feeling something that I had never felt before, never in my entire life. I looked around at our home. I looked at Moon drawing a picture at the kitchen counter. I looked at James playing with superhero figures on the floor not getting ready, and I felt empty, just dead inside. I felt as though I had given my kids and our family absolutely everything that I could and that it was all a complete and utter failure. I had given my kids and my family all of myself selflessly and unconditionally, and that it wasn't enough. Because I wasn't enough. I was failing my own children, just like I had failed my brother Sean. I thought, even when I really try for the people that I love, I'm still not good enough. This morning we hear Jesus deliver what has become known as the greatest commandment, which should really be called the greatest commandments, because there's two of them. But I don't pick the names. The story is pretty simple. Jesus is gathered together with some Sadducees, and, and they're grilling him on some theological points about the resurrection. The Sadducees argue that there is no resurrection, no life after death, and Jesus, of course, tells them that there is. When suddenly a scribe, basically a, a writer or a copier, comes up to Jesus and these Sadducees, the scribe really likes what he hears Jesus saying. Jesus' argument makes a whole lot of good sense to the scribe. So this scribe asks Jesus a question. He says, which commandment is greatest of all? Or which commandment is greatest, is, is first of all? 
And Jesus says, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one you shall love. The Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This answer makes sense. This answer would not have come as a surprise to anyone in Jesus' day. For this commandment, taken from the book of Deuteronomy, was famous. It was known as the Shema Israel, for the commandment's first two words in Hebrew. This was far and away the most famous and important commandment in the whole of Israel's spiritual life. Faithful Israelites spoke that commandment every single day as a form of prayer. Faithful Jews all over the world continue <coughs> to pray and to speak this commandment, the Shema Israel, every day. And whatever else he may be, Jesus was certainly a good and faithful Israelite. Jew. How could Jesus not cherish this commandment? And we get this commandment. As Christians, we carry this with us as well. We may not agree <coughs> on many things these days, but we can at least all agree that we should love God. So great, there's one part of the commandments down. Love God. No problem. No argument. Jesus goes further. One commandment just isn't enough. He says the second commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We all know this one. Even if you don't know anything about Christianity, you still probably have heard about this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. We teach this to kids in kindergarten. Now we as Christians hear this. And we get love your neighbor. We understand it. We internalize it. We're not always good at it. We may not always agree on who exactly our neighbor is, but we at least know that we're supposed to love our neighbor. Again, I don't think that most Christians are going to argue over this point. Love your neighbor. Got it. Done. Great. There's two parts of the commandment down. No problem. And at this point, it feels like we've got everything figured out. We need to love God and we need to love our neighbor. We've checked all the boxes. There's no one left to love here. That's how I always read these commandments. That's how I always understood them. That's what I always understood to be the essence of Christian discipleship. Loving God and loving your neighbor. I thought so long as I can say that I faithfully and diligently did these two things, then nothing else really mattered. I felt guilty when I left my brother Sean at the school all those years ago because I failed to show love for him by leaving him stranded up there at the school. Growing up as a kid, I felt guilty when I slept in and didn't cooperate with my parents about getting ready for church because in doing so, I felt that I had failed to put my love for God into action by getting myself out of bed in the morning. This all made sense to me. Love God, love your neighbor, but why then? I feel so guilty. Why did I feel so much shame all those years later, sitting, weeping on my ottoman in the middle of my family room after I had sacrificed everything to be there for my family in their time of need? I prayed to God diligently. I loved them absolutely. Why then did I feel so empty myself. I was a Christian. I loved God. I loved my neighbor. What was I missing here? For a long time, I asked myself that question, and for a long time, I couldn't seem to come up with an answer, no matter how I thought about it. I still felt like a failure. 
things got worse before they got better. In fact, it was not until several years later that I began to understand where I had gone wrong. And it turns out that the answer was right here in these very commandments, hiding right in plain sight. I just didn't see it. You see, I look back on these two stories from my past, the time I left my brother Saw and stranded, and the time I spent weeping on my ottoman, crushed with guilt and shame in my family room, and I call the first one selfish, Vince, and I call the second one selfless, Vince. And you know what? Neither of them were happy. And I came to learn that in both of these cases, I was unhappy because I had um, overlooked an important feature of Jesus' second commandment this morning. I was called to love my neighbor, to love those around me, just as I was called to love myself. I was not loving my neighbor when I left my brother Sean up at the school all those years ago. And I was not loving myself when I made my whole life, all my time and my energy and my attention, all about my family with no regard for myself. Of course I loved them. Of course they mattered. But I mattered too. Somewhere along the line, I had forgotten that. I had given so much of myself to them that there was nothing left to give. And in my emptiness and my shame, my ability to act upon my love for them suffered. My love for them became less because it was not matched by a love for myself. I could no longer give them the fullness of my life and my love and my energy because I was no longer a full person. There may have been two commandments, but there are three parts to it. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Here in the church, we're real good at preaching and talking about the first two of those. We're not so good at the third. We forget that the same Savior who told us to take up our crosses also told us to shake the dust off of our heels, to leave toxic situations and relationships, and to seek more welcoming communities and environments when we are feeling the dread rejected, mistreated, or just downhearted. The same Messiah that told us to deny ourselves for his sake also said, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Not your neighbor. Not God. You. There is no shame in laying down a burden that you do not have the strength. You see, the call of Jesus is a constant one. To love your neighbor as yourself is a balancing act. It means constantly placing our own spiritual and emotional and physical welfare in dialogue with the welfare of those around us. It means remembering that I am called to love my neighbor as myself, not better than myself, and not worse than myself. It means recognizing the bonds of equity, the shared dignity, value, and self-worth of each and every person, including ourselves. It means recognizing that no one is entitled to more love and no one is deserving of less. Always and everywhere. Love God. Love God loudly. Love God proudly. Love God often. Love your 
neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor and yourself. Maybe in your life you've been doing one of those a whole lot better than you've been doing the other. Whichever one of those that is, do not forget. Jesus wants you to do both. Please pray with me this morning. Lord, this morning we come to you from different places. For some of us, we have been loving ourselves maybe a little too well, maybe a little too often. We ask that you help us to see our neighbor a little more clearly, that we might love them a little more powerfully, that we might love them a little better. For others, we've been loving our neighbors so often, so long, and so well that we have forgotten to love ourselves. Lord, as we reach out to you this morning with our love for you, we ask that you return that love back to us that we might share it with our neighbors and share it with ourselves. Amen.
James has, has been wrestling with a, a near constant barrage of bugs for the past couple of weeks because that's just what happens to, to James, we found. And he is at home resting with with mom, doing well, just a little cold, nothing, nothing too serious. But, but it means that I've lost my helper for, for a noisy offering. And so I'd instead like to hand hand things over to Kamea and Trisha Wicker. <coughs> Uh, this week, we are supporting Lake Louise Christian Community, as, as those of you who joined us last week will remember. This Sunday in worship, we shared Peace Like a River, which is one of my favorite songs. I sing Peace Like a River around the house all the time, uh, much to my, my family's annoyance um, at, at times. Uh, but I wanted to give you all a little taste of camp. Peace Like a River is one of many, many camp songs that, that we sing, and I wanted us to have a little bit of that spirit here. Trisha volunteered last year as a counselor at Lake Louise, and she is going back this year. Uh, and so I hope that you all dug deep and you've got lots and lots of change to share with us this morning. And, and at that, I will leave it to the two of you. Several months ago, it was, it was back in the winter, um, but his family has waited to, to have a memorial service. They knew that there were many people who would want to come out and, and honor and, and uh, be there for the family in, in mourning Herb's passing, but, but we're going to be out of state during the winter. And so they wanted to, to wait until the summer when everyone was, was back in Michigan again. And so join us next, uh, not next, Saturday, May 20th a few Saturdays away. Uh, there will be, all the details are in your bulletins on the back. There will be a visitation from 12 to 2 right here at the church and a memorial service to follow at 2 o'clock here, here at the church. So if you, if you knew Herb Mueller, um, please, please plan to come out and, and join us for that memorial service. I know the family would be grateful to see all of you there. Any other announcements? Anything from United Methodist Women? 
All right, excellent, my friends. I invite you all to receive this word of blessing as we close out our worship service this morning. May you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind, and with all your soul. And may you love your neighbor as yourself. May the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. My friends, you are deeply loved. I invite you to go forth this morning in peace. I don't love my neighbor. You don't love your neighbor? Um, you know. <laughs> it's possible. Maybe, it's, maybe we got another sermon coming. It's possible to love people without liking them.